Hello and welcome to lecture 22 from the class From Data to Decisions. My name is Chris Back, the professor for this course, and we're going to talk about influence and in regression. In our last lecture, we discussed the topic of leverage, and now we're going to extend that topic to talk about influence. Reviewing outliers are data with an extreme value in the response variable y. Uh, so extreme that we suspect there might be a problem with it. Leverage points are data with an extreme value of the predictor variable x. And that's kind of a general way of, of thinking about it. Uh, as we saw last time, leverage is uh, data points with high values of the diagonal of the hat matrix, HII. If we have some combination of an extreme y value, an outlier, and an extreme x value, a leverage, that makes the data point influential. And in fact, it's influence that we care most about when it comes to regression. The definition of an influential data point is one where removing that data point substantially changes the results of our, our regression. We're going to talk about what substantial means as we go along. And also, there's more than one result of a regression. And we'll talk about different results as well. One of the ways in which we uh, measure influence is with something called Cook's distance. So one of the results of a regression is a model that allows us to predict certain values of the predictor variable. So why? hat is a predicted y value. y hat j is the jth predicted y value. So if I have a set of n data points, well then first predicted value, the second predicted value, etc. What I'm going to do is take this prediction and say, let me fit the model excluding the ith data point. Uh, by the way, this nomenclature, this notation of parenthesis i as a subscript, is very common to, to mean we're uh, showing the results with the ith data point removed. So if I were to take out the ith data point and then fit the model again, and then predict what the jth data would look like without the influence of i, uh, that would be this number. The difference between including i, the ith data point, and excluding the ith data point is, is this difference. If I square that difference and sum them all up for every single data point in my data set, I get the sum of the squared differences in the predicted values with the ith data point included or not. I'm going to normalize that by dividing by uh, the variance of all the residuals of the total fit with ith included, uh, multiplied by p, the number of parameters in the model. We'll call this distance. Well, you might think that's kind of a cumbersome item to calculate because I have to fit the model n plus 1 times, n uh, one time with all the data points, and then separate time with every single data point moved um, to get all of the Cook's distances for every data point i. Uh, quite cumbersome. However, it, it actually is easier than it looks because we can reformulate uh, this. Uh, you know, It's a bit of an extended uh, derivation to show that this is true, but uh, we can reformulate it in terms of the residuals themselves. So. Uh, either of these formulas work. The simplest one is this one. I take the internally studentized residual, the ith data point, I square it, divide by p, and then multiply by uh, the leverage over 1 minus the leverage. This also helps us understand why the Cook's distance is a good measure of influence. First, leverage, hii over 1 minus hii. Remember that HII close to zero means not very much leverage. Close to one means a lot of leverage. So 
when there's not much leverage, this term goes becomes very small. But when HII approaches one, a lot of leverage, this term becomes very, very large. So uh, that, that second term describes the amount of leverage in the data point. ISR squared, size of the residual squared, when the residual is very big, that means a, a, a large deviation in uh, what, what we got for y versus what we expected. So kind of the, the magnitude of the residual squared also is a part of the influence. So the product of those two things is what defines an influential data point. Now, the Cook's distance is a measure of influence, but it is not something we do statistical tests on. It's important to know that not all outliers are influential. Not all influential data points are outliers. These are different things. We don't remove influential points. We don't adjust influential points. When we call a point influential, that's not the same thing as calling it an outlier, and we don't treat it the same way. The goal of using the Cook's distance and the other measures we're about to learn about is to identify influential points. Why do we need to identify them? I'll, I'll, I'll show you two reasons, but the first reason is we want to determine whether our regression results are fragile. We say a re our regression result is fragile if our conclusions about this regression depend only on one or two data points. If I were to remove or, or substantially change just one or two data points, if I got completely different conclusions, then I worry about the fragility of my conclusions. Um, because you know something could go wrong with one data point, or maybe that data point um, is not what we think it is. Uh, and if I'm completely dependent upon only one or two data points, I start to get worried. One of the ways we use the Cook's distance, and I'll come back to that idea of fragility in a moment, but one of the ways we use the Cook's distance is by graphing up the Cook's distance for every single data point. So this is Cook's distance versus the x values of my uh, linear regression, but uh, I could also plot it versus the predicted y values, especially useful for multiple regressions. So I get uh, a, a plot, and what I look for is one of these or a couple of these Cook's distances much bigger than all the rest. How much bigger? What is a significant value of Cook's distance? Well, one piece of advice is to say one. Uh, Cook's distance of bigger than one is, is something significant. Well, if you go back and look at the definition of, of the Cook's distance, uh, it, it has the residuals divided by the standard error of the residuals, so that uh, a, a Cook's distance bigger than one means removing a data point is moving the result by more than one standard error. Right? That's uh, pretty significant. Uh, sometimes people think that for larger data sets that we need to lower the, the threshold at which we consider something significant. So some people like to use 4 over n as a rule of thumb. Uh, other people like to use the 50th percentile of the f distribution because we think Cook's distance should be about f distributed if the underlying distribution is normal. Uh, if you have two parameters and a, fair, the, and a fairly large number n, uh, say above 20, then the f distribution plateaus at about 0.7. So a little bit smaller than one, but uh, you know, on that same order. Uh, here, I had 38 data points, so 4 over n is, is closer to 0.1, which is a significantly reduced from, say, 0.7 or 1. Uh, you got to take these thresholds with, you know, a grain of salt. They're guidelines. They're not, this is not a statistical test, remember, right? So I see this one data point bigger than 4n, but it's only a little bit bigger than 4n, and it's not bigger than 1, and it's not bigger than 0.7. Chances are that's really not a problem. Uh, let's look at another case. This is uh, 
the Anscombe problem. Remember our uh, Anscombe uh, uh, graphs of regression examples where weird things were happening. One of them had an outlier, or at least we described it as an outlier. If we applied the Grubbs test, we'd find that this particular data point probably is an outlier the way we would define it. Um, but is it influential? Well, the Crookes distance says that it is. Here's the Crookes distance for all the data points. You see that the extreme data points are the ones with the largest Crookes distance. But this outlier, potential outlier, has the largest. And whether we use 4 over n um, or, or a value of 1 or the Crookes distance, we see that uh, it is bigger than that. So we would definitely describe this data point as an influential outlier, which means we got to deal with it. We have some other influence measures. For example, if the outcome of the regression that we're most interested in is the coefficients of our model, then we can ask, how does deletion of the ith data point change the value of the specific coefficient in our model? So if BK is the value of the kth model coefficient, I include all the data points, and BK for n i is the value of the ith, uh, excuse me, the kth beta, the kth uh, uh, model coefficient. If the ith data point removed, well then I ask how much difference is there, and I normalize the difference between these two by the standard error of that BK with the ith data point removed. That ratio, if it's say one, that means moving the removing the ith data point has moved the value of my coefficient by one standard error, which is significant. Um, if the coefficients of the model are what we're all about, if the only thing I care about is the slope of my line, that's the whole reason I did the experiment, then this is the best measure, EF beta, for uh, expressing the influence of the ith data point. Um, we can consider df beta to be significant if it's bigger than about one, although for larger data sets we might say say two over the square root of n, similar to our Cook's distance type of uh, measure. Another measure, like the Cook's distance, is the df fits. Uh, this is what happens to the ith prediction if the ith data point is removed. So the ith predicted value with the ith data point removed is then normalized by divided by the standard error of the ith residual, uh, and, and we get this df fits. Now, another way of calculating that, it simplifies to the externally studentized residual multiplied by the square root of hii over 1 minus hii. There's some other... Um, measures of influence that people use. Uh, these are the most popular ones. I'm not going to uh, talk about any of the others, but you might see them uh, discussed in other books or papers or literature that you look at. Let's review the three that we've looked at, the Crookes distance, the DF betas, and the DF fits. Uh, you, if you look carefully, you see that the Crookes distance is a square uh, versus DF beta and DF fits. So uh, DF fits in particular looks a lot like the square root of the Crookes distance. It uses an externally studentized residual instead of the internally studentized residual, and it doesn't divide by P, the number of parameters. But other than that, it's a fairly similar metric. Um, for small sample sizes, we always tend to use a criterion of about one. Whenever any of these metrics approach one, it means things are moving around by about a standard error when I delete that specific data point, and that's significant. For uh, large samples, uh, we might lower that sample, small sample criterion a bit. Um, uh, if n gets really large, though, I think these distances get very small. Uh, 4 over n, square root of 4 over n, 
uh, etc. So you have to use these criterion uh, for what it means to be influential uh, as guidelines, not, remember, we're not doing statistical tests here. Now, these are all easy to calculate if I have one regressor variable. Once I have two or more regressor variables, in other words, multiple regression, it really gets cumbersome to calculate these things by hand. Uh, so you're going to let your software package calculate all of these things for you. They'll often just spit out a table, everything. Or if you're working in R, you can just ask. There's another issue with multiple regression, which is the correlations between one predictor variable and another. Multicollinearity, it's called. We're going to talk about that later, but that becomes another issue we worry about, specifically multiple regression. A final topic I'll mention, also a preview of things to come. We're going to talk about design of experiments. A design of experiments is what X values should you use when designing your experiment? If you're, if you're doing an observation, the X values are whatever they are, the predictor variable values. But if you're doing your own experiment, you can decide what, bit, what range, how to space out the values of X. One of the goals of design of experiments is to make the leverage every single point the same. In other words, we make every HII exactly equal to P over N for every I. Uh, that means we don't have to worry about leverage or influence in our data points other than the possibility of outliers. Again, we'll talk about design of experiments later in the semester. All right, let's sum up what we've learned about influence. When we do regression, if we have a combination of an outlier and high leverage, we get something called influence. Outliers by themselves aren't necessarily a problem. High leverage all by itself is not necessarily a problem. But if we find that a data point is influential, then we have to be careful. When we do a regression, it's very useful to calculate for every single data point, internally studentized residual, the externally studentized residual, the leverage, Cook's distance, DF fits, DF beta, et cetera, and look at them all. We use the Williams graph, and we can graph the Cook's distance and the DF fits and the DF betas to get a feeling for influence. Then, when we apply our outlier tests, if we, if we identify something as being a potential outlier, when we apply outlier tests and, and confirm that this is an unusual data point under the assumptions of whatever our uh, distribution is, for example, normal distribution, we will consider deleting or altering those outliers only if they're influential. If they're not influential, that means if I leave it in or I take it out, it doesn't affect the results enough to worry about. Well, in that case, you might as well leave it in. It doesn't matter. The other, so that's the first way in which we're going to use the idea of influence is in how to treat outliers. We only deal with outliers uh, carefully and thoughtfully if it matters, if it really is influential. The other re reason we test for influence is to look for fragile regression results. Our results are fragile if we're overly sensitive to just a couple of data points. What do you do if you have a fragile result? The best thing by far is to go out and collect more data. Okay? Go find uh, the influential data points and collect more data in that region of your process space. Try to double up, triple up on those data points. That will make the results less fragile, less sensitive to any specific data point. All right, lecture 22, what have we learned? You should be able to quickly and easily define influence. Name several metrics of influence. Explain what is meant by a fragile regression. And finally, how does a measure of influence affect 
the way we approach outliers. Well, that's my lecture so far. Till next time.